Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the Director of Education here at the Carlos Museum, and it's so nice to welcome all of you who are here in person today. It's wonderful to see people. I do apologize that we don't have tea and scones, but I promise when better days get here, we will return to tea and scones. Welcome to all of you who are also joining us via Zoom. Um, we're delighted today to have um, a, a antiqui our antiquity program. And many of you may know about the Sinuseret collection that came to the Carlos Museum in 2019. And our, our curator, Dr. Melinda Hartwig and Renee Stein and the staff in the Parsons Conservation Lab are actively at work researching and preparing the pieces for exhibition in 2023. And so today we are delighted to welcome Emily Whitehead, who is a PhD candidate in the art history department, and Caitlin Wright, who is the Andrew W. Mellon conserv assistant conservator, nope, Ad advanced fellow, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> very advanced, because she knew how to work presenter mode, um, here in the Parsons Conservation Lab at the Carlos, and they will be talking to you about the evolution of this really fascinating um, ancient Egyptian boat. I won't say anything more about it so that you can. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emily Whitehead, a doctoral candidate here in the uh, history department at Emory, and I'm really delighted to be speaking to you today. Um, with Caitlin Wright on an ancient Egyptian uh, model boat in the museum's collection that has been the subject of my Mellon Fellowship in Object-Centered Curatorial Research since the beginning of 2020. These fellowships allow graduate students to focus on an object within the collection and explore it from all angles with curators here at the Carlos Museum, faculty advisors, and conservators. Uh, some of the most important finds in this project have come from conversations with the boat sitting between us and the back and forth between the technical analyses and the Egyptological research. So when Elizabeth suggested that this project could be shared as an antiquity, as a dialogue between Caitlin and I, it fit the project pretty perfectly. I'm gonna start us off by introducing you all to this fascinating boat its context in antiquity, and the sort of questions that it raised. We'll then be going back and forth, roughly chronologically, through the technical analyses, what they answered, and how they worked in conjunction with other forms of research to inform both the treatment and the future display of the boat. So the boat itself uh, came into the museum as part of the Sinuseret collection in 2018 as a gift of the Georges Ricard Foundation. It's a striking object on multiple levels. It's nearly three feet in length, yet it still looks overcrowded. It has uh, 10 standing sailors and two kneeling men at the uh, bow here and the stern here. To further complicate matters, the furniture at both the bow and the stern um, were originally found on boats with no crew at all. There is also a great deal of evidence of fill and overpaint, both on the figures and on the deck itself. So from the very start, this boat posed many questions, including what was this boat originally? Where does it, or perhaps more specifically, where do each of the elements come from? What were their contexts, their purposes, and their functions? And how did it come to be um, how it is today? Starting from the context in antiquity, we know that the boat fits into a category of grave goods that we call tomb models. These were found from the late Old Kingdom to the mid to late Middle Kingdom, approximately 2200 to 1850. Uh, BCE, and they were found in, in, in uh, cemeteries across Egypt. They were generally deposited in the burial chambers of elite individuals, both next to and on top of their coffins. 
We can see here from images of an excavation in the early 20th century um, of the tomb shaft of Antef at Beni Hassan, that there's quite a variety of uh, models in a burial such as this. And we have in one of these views, uh, a rowing vessel, um, very visible. These models are generally made out of wood and are painted, um, some quite elaborately so, um, such as uh, this uh, uh, female offering bearer, her dress is really quite uh, fantastic. Two models can include both male and female figures bearing offerings of food, linen, and, and other goods. Um, these examples are from the tomb of Meket Ray and are now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Two models could also include scenes of agriculture and food production. And you might be familiar with this one here. It's on display in the Carlos Museum and it's a baking and butchery scene. Less common are scenes of uh, workshops and craft activities like uh, carpentry and weaving. And these are on display in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. <clears throat> Granaries are some of the more common scenes that we see of food production. And here I have um, two different approaches to the same scene of depositing grain and scribes keeping, um, keeping account of what's going on. Um, these two side by side show the extent of variation we see across burials and also regionally. Um, this one here is from Dar al Bersha, which is in Middle Egypt. And uh, the one here is uh, also from the tomb of Meket Ray in Thebes in the south. Now a question that's often posed is why a model of food production or of carpentry or a boat for that matter um, is being placed in a tomb. And to answer this, Egyptologists have frequently turned to the fact that models generally share the same themes as we see in tomb wall paintings from the same period. Here, for example, we see a facsimile of a granary scene from the tomb of Amenemhat. And tomb wall paintings include representations of the um, mortuary cult, so such as offerings and food production, which represent and make manifest the ongoing activities and relationships between the living and the dead. When compared to the models, two more paintings add to our interpretation in several ways, particularly through associated inscriptions, but also to break down some of the previous ideas that they were somehow toy-like or coming to life in the afterlife. And this is particularly relevant for interpretations of the boat models. Boat models are some of the most frequently studied of the tomb models and the most common kinds <clears throat> are pairs of sailing and rowing vessels, which indicate some form of travel both up and downstream on the Nile. So seeming to encapsulate a journey both there and back again. In these two exceptionally well executed and really quite large examples from the tomb of Meket Ray, we see what is clearly an important figure um, under the canopy. And in the case of the sailing vessel, their offerings and a scroll being presented to him. In turning to comparisons with two wall paintings, it's been suggested that these models represent a journey there and back from cult centers at Abydos or Bucyrus. These are important centers for the worship of the god Osiris. And one such example um, is here from the tomb of Antifika and his wife Senate, where a scene of a rowing boat transporting the couple is captioned with that um, pilgrimage to Abydos. So that's where we're getting that information from. Two more paintings also um, depict a variety of other uh, boats. And while they're less common than our paired sailing and rowing vessels, 
we also have uh, funerary barks, uh, kitchen and sporting vessels. Uh, kitchen and sporting vessels uh, fall into the realm of, of food production. And those funerary barks are comparable to depictions we have of the transportation of the deceased as part of the funeral in some two wall paintings. However, there's one type of boat that is particularly relevant um, to this particular conversation, which are not found in these uh, paintings of the Middle Kingdom, and they are termed uh, solar boats. Solar boat models are extremely rare. They were only produced for a short period of time, just prior to when uh, models stopped being produced at all and just prior to a significant change in burial practices in ancient Egypt. Their lack of figures is particularly notable in the Middle Kingdom um, and seems to suggest that they have a different role and function to the figural vessels that have been so common in burials up to this point. They share a very particular set of boat furniture, which identifies them with other later depictions of the morning and night barks of the sun god Ra, hence why we call them solar boats. For our purposes, I want to draw your attention to the bow, um, which here is the cover has been, has been moved, but would have been there. The uh, falcons, both uh, on their backs on the box here and on top of the cylindrical object here, and this shrine object, a box with posts on each corner, because these are found on our boat model. And this is where we started from um, when it came to our technical analyses and um, the further Egyptological research. We knew that the sailors, the mast, the kneeling figures, the hull and boat furniture didn't all belong together. But our questions remained as to what came from where and how it all came together to become the boat that we see today. And Caitlin's going to start us off on that. So the boat came to the lab um, around the beginning of COVID. And we've sort of been getting to this point now, just to give you an idea of how long we've been looking at the boat. Um, and I've enjoyed the time we've spent together looking, discovering new things, chatting a lot about treatment decisions. Um, and even though I've stared at this object for a really long time, like a really long time, um, I'm still seeing new things all the time because of the complex surfaces that we see. Um, in this close-up image, you can see some of the condition issues and interventions that we encounter when we start to look closely at this boat, like excess adhesive and different campaigns of overpaint and some stains, um, chipping, excess plaster. And so this sort of complicates our immediate understanding of what exactly is going on here. And so one of the first steps in a technical study or a conservation treatment um, is taking many, many photographs. And we use different modes of digital photography to help us better understand the materials present as well as these past interventions. So we'll take a normal light pair, which you see on the far left. Um, and so the camera doesn't move throughout this process, but filters that absorb and transmit specific wavelengths of light and light sources are changed based on what type of photography you're doing. So the middle image um, is an ultraviolet induced visible fluorescence image. And in this technique, the object is exposed to ultraviolet radiation with a UV lamp. And this technique is particularly useful in visualizing previous interventions, as well as certain pigments, coatings, and varnishes. Materials either absorb or reflect. So when a material absorbs this, UV radiation, we get fluorescence, as you can see in some of this fill material that was added in the transport. So a lot of the objects in the Snoozer collection had quick triage type conservation treatment to be able to get here safely. And often the materials that we use can be differentiate, differentiated easily, oops, in these different modes of photography. 
And then you see here reflection in this restoration material where they've put a bunch of excess plaster when they reattached this element here. So in addition to um, UV imaging, we also have visible induced infrared luminescence, which is particularly useful in the imaging of Egyptian objects. Um, so in this technique, which is commonly used in forensic work for seeing ink where the pigments faded, um, it utilizes blue-green visible light that causes materials to luminesce, luminesce in infrared wavelengths. And so Egyptian blue happens to be the poster child for this technique and in objects conservation, we're often using it to find it. And as you can see in areas where there's blue stripes, we see this bright luminescence in our object. So we can confirm the presence of Egyptian blue in this way. We also, we viewed all parts of the boat um, with these different modes of photography and UV was particularly helpful in understanding um, the deck surface. It's, it enhances a bit this red framework as well as reflecting areas of um, restoration. So you can see where there's some plaster that's fluorescing a bit, but also another coating that's been added. Um, lots of interventions have happened. Um, and so this excess plaster can also lead us to further confirm our, our hypothesis that these figures have been added um, because in ancient Egypt, wood was fit together. Um, joins would be tension fit instead of using some kind of adhesive or plaster to hold objects together. And so pigments were further analyzed with handheld X-ray fluorescence, um, which gives us qualitative information about what elements are present. So the lack of luminescence in the green striped areas combined with the presence of arsenic and copper suggests that instead of mixing Egyptian blue with an arsenic containing yellow pigment like orpiment to make green, they modified a copper containing green pigment by mixing it with what is likely orpiment. We also saw a strong peak for arsenic on the bird, a very strong peak, um, which suggests that it might have been painted yellow, the orpiment. And the presence of zinc in the wig likely points, the wig here, likely points towards one of the campaigns of restoration. Both the imaging and the XRF um, further confirmed our conclusions that um, the bow, the, sh uh, the shrine and the bird were from a solar boat. In particular, as Caitlin said about the find on the, of arsenic on the bird, um, indicating that it had been potentially painted yellow. This is in keeping with other birds, um, falcons found on two solar boats in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, which are visibly still painted yellow. The imaging of the hull showing that red framework of decking, however, is found on both solar and sailing boats. So the question remained somewhat open as to whether we were looking at a sailing boats hull um, with solar boats components added or a solar boat hull with sailors added. So our, our next step was uh, CT scanning the boat. So identifying the materials present on the surface of the object only allowed us to go so far. For a full understanding of this object's life, it was crucial that we were able to see inside, see these, the ways in which these figures were attached and what evidence of attachments in antiquity we could find. Um, the lab does not have an x-ray tube on site and we certainly do not have a CT scanner either. <laughs> and for this reason, we often collaborate with the radiology department at Emory University Hospital, which we love, it's so cool. Um, we are incredibly grateful for their expertise and their enthusiasm. It's like always super fun to go there. They're so excited to not be imaging humans. Um, <laughs> And so we love their enthusiasm for the work we do, and we are really enthusiastic about them. So thank you, shout out. Um, and so sometimes when we take things over there, we kind of see what we expect to see. Um, but in this case, it was a particularly, particularly illuminating um, and exciting experience. So CT scanning works by taking a series of X-ray images and from these slices, it creates a 3D model that you can navigate through, you can see in the video. And 
Over 800 slices were taken of the boat, which allowed us to see all of the dowels, modifications, and attachment that we were so attachments that we were so curious about. So these slices are representative of evidence that suggest original versus interventive attachments. So we have voids from original attachments. We have ancient dowels that you can see here that are quite dense and as you can see, snugly fit. So they were very exacting in the way that they carved and fit wood together. Um, and being able to move through these slices can also show us positions of the dowels as well. So this video shows as we move through the scan, we can see this dowel sort of going through a larger void um, and it's at an angle, which told Emily some cool stuff. Yes, I was very <laughs> excited to see this um, because these three large voids um, for dowels indicated an object that was attached would have been actually quite large, um, which was in keeping with the really quite large uh, finials um, that we see on the sterns of solar boats, um, which is highlighted in red there. And so once we started looking at these CT scans for a while, we started to notice that all of the places that contained this excess plaster that was likely added when the, when the figures were attached to the hull, that we see this sort of auger bit shape, which is one of those bits that's flat and has a pointy part that pulls material out while you're drilling. And all of these holes that are much larger than the feet of the figures have this very um, exact bit, which sort of suggests more uh, a modern hole that was being made. And you can see how this excess plaster also goes up and over covering up some ancient dowel holes um, that still have remnants of the dense thin dowels in here as well. And this um, video shows the extent of the different types of voids and dowels again that we're seeing. Um, there's holes at the top and you know small dowels holding this element together as well as original voids and new holes. And many of the figures also have metal pins um, holding the shoulder to the arm, um, which is not something that would have been done in antiquity either. So what we did is we mapped all of the smaller original dowel holes that have been uh, covered over um, and also all those that have been made for legs, the mast and the movement of the shrine. In this diagram, we've included in green uh, all of the original dowel holes um, that are currently covered over. And in orange, we've included just four of the holes made uh, for legs. As it looks like given their locations, um, they may have been uh, drilled over the place of original dowel holes. These thankfully <laughs> all corresponded to um, holes that would be expected for furniture of a solar bark. Um, so we're therefore able to be fairly conclusive that we're looking at a solar bark hull with sailors added um, and the furniture moved around a bit. This is therefore one of approximately six solar bark holes um, that we know of worldwide. So it's, it's really quite a rare object. Um, and from these CT scans imaging um, and XRF, we had a good picture of um, how the solar boat was originally, which provided Caitlin further information to guide her treatment of the boat. And so, as Emily said, all of this um, information contributed a lot to my decision making process, which was often um, belabored <laughs> and took a long time. Um, but after the initial examination, uh, I began the much needed stabilization of the fragile paint layer on the figure. So the boat did sit for a while during COVID um, when we weren't in the lab and we came back to see that it had shed a bunch of itself all over itself. And I was like, oh great, this is gonna be a much bigger treatment than I had anticipated. Um, but this issue presented itself mostly on the figures likely because of overpaint on top of an underbound 
ancient layer or just you know complex surfaces not agreeing with each other. Um, and so this is an after treatment image. Um, much of the surface area on these figures needed consolidation. And so I chose an adhesive that, I tested a lot of adhesives and chose an adhesive that's commonly used in Asian paintings conservation called Finori, which is a seaweed mucilage that dries very matte. Um, and it was, I think, met with pretty good results. Um, you, there's not too much staining, but these arms have been completely consolidated. Um, this wig has been completely consolidated. So that part of, well, this treatment was quite successful. I was gonna say that part, but it should all be successful. Um, and this is an example of an area with fills um, where I've filled over uh, fills from transport that were sort of stabilizing fills. And this sort of illustrates the selective nature um, in which I approached visual compensation. I was only filling and in-painting over areas where it might've been not that they couldn't have been removed, but might have been quite difficult to remove. And so decided to just do visual compensation on top of it. But you can see I haven't, you know, filled every area and in painted it to make it look perfect. It was a very um, choosy matter. And so this is the after treatment image. And so in that way, it also involved sort of a reconciliation of some of the heavy handed um, plaster fills that were um, applied during restoration. And so after many conversations, we decided to reduce some of this plaster um, to sort of make these, make this connection more discreet because in Comparanda and at the element on the other end of the boat, you could sort of see where they butted up against each other and there wasn't this smooth um, surface between them. So I excavated out as much of this plaster as I could and also used paper fills to cover up plaster where it was too difficult to remove. Um, so there are a bit of paper fills, which we like to use often in conservation and objects conservation because they're quite easy to remove. Um, and so here I've done a paper fill over some unsightly uh, plaster and then this area has paper fills to sort of tidy this up um, visually. So there's a better understanding of um, what's present. And all of these um, interventions are quite visible under UV. You can see where I've done a, another paper fill there. And so these are before and after treatment images before on the left um, and then after on the right. And it, most of the conservation treatment was consolidation, but then, as I said, um, just visual tidying to sort of make these elements understood as themselves, since we are we know, you know, that they don't exactly go there, and we don't know exactly what they would have looked like. Um, and so just cleaning up of this excess plaster. And then after treatment, we've continued to pursue questions related to what materials are present and if they align with those used by ancient Egyptians. So in material identification, it's often necessary to observe materials under high magnification. For looking at fibers present um, in one of the figure's hands, I took a small sample and you can see how tiny it is um, on the slide compared to the wood samples that look enormous in comparison. Um, and this video shows how looking at materials under the polarizing light microscope, which is on the right in the lab, um, can make beautiful colors. Um, because as you move the stage, the light pass is refracted through the material at different angles and creates this rainbow effect that we call birefringence. And so this is where I took the sample from, this little linen cord. Oh, I just gave it away, it's linen. <laughs> The nodes are what appear to be the X's throughout the fibers tell us that, that it is a bass fiber, something like linen that would have been used in antiquity. And so you can see a lot of these X, X's here. Um, and looking at the sample under, micro, under the microscope also showed um, this very heavily bound 
layer of paint. So you can see it is painted as well, the same color as the figures. And we sort of think that this might be evidence towards um, it being overpainted as well, because you wouldn't really see this much globby adhesive um, holding pigment on like that. And so the bigger identification um, project for this study has been the identification of wood species present. So it can provide us with more evidence of the hull's antiquity, as well as potentially grouping figures or elements, even though it is common to mix and match woods of the time. So through this project, we also hope in the lab to provide micrographs and IDs where possible, either in like a database that can be accessed online or when you pull an object up on our objects website. If we have this information, hopefully we'll be uploading it soon. Um, but to take a wood sample, you first have to know the orientation of the wood relative to how it grew when it was a tree. So in wood ID, we're concerned with three different planes of the tree, the cross-sectional plane, which is here, the radial plane, which comes out radially, and the tangential plane. And these different planes reveal the different characteristic cell structures that, tell, that can tell us evidence of what species it might be. And so species, luckily for us, species of trees um, used in ancient Egypt and the Mediterranean have been thoroughly studied. Um, here are a few fun prepared reference sections. They're always very beautiful um, from a wonderful book, Atlas of Wood, Bark and Pith Anatomy of Eastern Mediterranean Trees and Shrubs. So these lists and uses for these five species, both the species and the uses are not exhaustive. Um, there are many more species, but I thought, this group illustrated well how you can see quickly that there are um, obvious differences between these types of wood. Um, ficus and tamarics are both hardwoods, and so is Zizophus spinacristi. Um, so they have vessel elements, um, a feature that softwoods like Aleppo pine and cedar of Lebanon lack. So the Zizophus spinacristi is dense as evidenced um, by its smaller cellular structure. And this wood was mostly used for carving dowels and small objects because it was easier to carve. Um, ficus and tamarics, which there are many different species of, um, are in, in studies, the woods you see the most, especially with larger objects because the trees were bigger and they had more access to this type of wood. So on my quest for relearning the language of wood anatomy um, post-grad school, <laughs> I was lucky to have a few samples from Renee from objects that she had treated in the past um, that allowed me to practice sectioning and also train my eye to real piece, not, well, it's all real wood, but <laughs> looking at a sample of wood rather than the perfect sections that are in textbooks. And there are many factors that complicate ancient wood ID um, the wood's desiccated, which leads to damage in the sampling process. There's insect damage, which I saw in both of these samples. Um, salts, which can sometimes look like different features in the wood. And when you're sampling or looking at wood on an object, how much of a certain surface you have, and depending on the shape and what part of the tree, um, can give you different information and kind of limit the features that you can see. So to observe a sample, you have to clear the planes that I mentioned before um, with a sharp blade. And on the left, we have a sample of tamarisk. Um, and you, you can see in this sample, the rays are much wider than these vessels that are often by themselves, but in clusters up to four. Um, and on the right is a sample of ficus. I think it's a sample of ficus carica and not sycamorus. Um, and the vessel elements here are much larger than the rays, which you can see, difficult to see in this image. But when you take a thin section, so this is a thin section, which is um, a little shaving that's only microns thin. Um, under high magnification, you can better see these cellular structures. So here you can't really see these rays running up and down, but in the, in the thin section, you can. It's also helpful for taking more exact measurements of these features. 
So the tangential view of these samples allows you to observe rays along with others. And again, the features on the tam and so I took an image of both of these samples together to show how even macroscopically you can see that the, the cellular features on tamarisk are much larger than those on ficus. Um, and so the, our digital microscope in the lab allowed for easy measuring of these features. Um, Tamarix rays are composed of a lot of cells. They're very wide and very tall, whereas ficus cells can be singular um, and also have larger, larger rays. And they also have these sort of gash-like areas of vessel elements. So with all that in mind, um, Luckily, we had the CT scan, which helped me better visualize where a good spot to take a sample would be. Um, we decided to take a sample because the hull is completely painted and it, we were unable to clear any surfaces to give us a cross-sectional view. And this sample that's quite small, eight millimeters wide, can be replaced after we're done looking at it. So maybe it looks like one of the reference sections that I showed before. Um, it has the stripy appearance of ficus sycamorus due to this alternating thick-walled fibers and thin-walled parenchymous tissue. In the tangential view, it further confirms the idea of ficus sycamorus because it has these smaller and larger rays that terminate in these um, triangular shapes. And this is just cool. I didn't really need, need to show this, but <laughs> this is um, ovoid alternate intervessel pitting, which is also characteristic of ficus sycamorus. And it's just a cool picture, I think. So further examination and grouping of the figures based on wood density might lead one to find some stylistic differences and similarities between the figures. So now we know that the hall is likely ficus sycamorus. And we have um, some slices where you see two figures here that have a similar density to the ficus, whereas a kneeling figure here appears more radio opaque and is therefore um, a more dense wood. So hopefully Emily can, or together we can start to group these figures. So the wood typing and the analysis of the linen um, adds considerably to um, what we know about the figures on the boat. Uh, the linen in the hand of one of them um, is a piece of rigging um, and further confirms that in all likelihood, the 10 standing figures are sailors, not standing figures that might be from some other model. However, we've got quite a few of them, too many to be from just one sailing vessel. Uh, sailing vessels seem to usually have at most five to six standing figures manning the rigging. In the case of um, this example uh, from the tomb of uh, Jehudi Nacht, the figures are of a similar size to our own, and there are actually only two manning the rigging. Um, we've got two punting and um, a fifth, maybe acting as a lookout. Um, and so it seems likely that our standing figures are from at least two different boats. The wood typing combined with um, looking at the density and perhaps looking at um, uh, the stylistic features may help us to group these sailors more effectively. And this is one of our uh, next steps to look into. However, we're going to have to keep in mind as, as Caitlin said that there have been models found that use a mix of wood within the same model. Um, so we might not be able to come up with as conclusive an answer as with the uh, solar boat elements. However, when we turn to Comparanda, our two kneeling figures are somewhat unusual and may aid us in narrowing down some of the possibilities for the types of sailing vessels um, that they are from. What makes them particularly unusual is that they have one arm down at their sides and the other across their chest. They had previously been identified as rowers, which would have meant that they were from a completely different vessel from the sailors. Um, this seems highly unlikely as rowers are usually shown with both hands able to grasp an oar um, and even their uh, 
um, arm dance sides wouldn't have been able to uh, do that. A similar gesture is seen here on uh, one of the Meket Ray boats, and it's understood as a gesture of um, adoration towards an image of the deceased. So this could suggest that our two kneeling figures were near some form of image of the deceased, seated in an example such as this, or mama form on a bear of a funerary boat. Funerary boats generally have two female attendants at either end of the uh, deceased, a seated figure uh, steering, and occasionally priestly attendants with scrolls. However, there are some rare examples with kneeling attendants who similarly have this one arm free, and even rarer still, they could include sailors and a mast. In both cases, either um, the sailing vessel or a, or a funerary boat, some of our sailors, the mast and the kneeling figures may have come from the same vessel. Um, the possibility of a funerary boat being one of the figured vessels is particularly appealing to me um, as the funerary vessels with sailors and masts appear for a very short period of time and towards the late Middle Kingdom, just when we're getting the innovation of the solar boats at the same time. However, it will <laughs> likely remain largely an open question um, what type um, and how many boats our crew come from. Therefore, when it comes to displaying this model, the use of digital reconstructions alongside uh, the boat will demonstrate the several possible originals that make up uh, the boat before you. Um, and here's an example of what it might have looked like as a solar boat. This will acknowledge uh, the different purposes, whether that's several figured sailing boats um, carrying the deceased to and from Abydos, or vessels transporting the deceased to burial, making manifest those relationships between the living and the dead, or a solar bark without its figures and at an important point of transition between burial practices. It also acknowledges the life history of this work and what it might tell us about the market in such objects in the late 19th and early 20th century when this boat was likely compiled into what it is today. It's fairly common to see models in collections around the world uh, with an additional figure or item added such that it is actually barely noticeable and others with figures and objects that are not not noticeably out of place like uh, granary figures on a boat, butchers in a baking scene, or in our case, sailors on a solar bark. It's really important to highlight that this is common in this type of object to open up that conversation around uh, how such objects have come to be compiled as they are, the challenges that that poses to researchers, and then how we might be able to um, uh, display them in the future. So as we uh, finish up today, we would like to acknowledge uh, everyone we've worked with on this project, and we're really looking forward to your questions. Right, so if you will Oh, oh, I'll end show and see what comes up. Yeah. Okay, so, um, oh, someone, oh, Megan. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, a great paper. It's wonderful to see your collaborative research. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, how you know or why you think this, these interventions happened in the late 19th or early 20th century? Did, it have, did you test the materials that were used or is it speculation based on comparisons? Um, it's mainly based on comparisons. There's one very similar compiled solar boat that's in San Jose. Um, which was sold in the 1920s, and it was compiled. It was already compiled at that point. 
Um, and so uh, it's been suggested that that one, our solar boat and one other that's in um, the museum in Cairo were compiled at the same time because they look very, very similar in the way that they were put together. In addition, um, the plaster that we see, um, you'll have to come see it in person sometime. It's, there's a lot of it um, and it's very, um, you can see how it was worked wet um, on some of the original surfaces where they've added plaster in the cracks to sort of fill between. And then you see like a thumbprint where they've smeared black paint across. I, I don't know if you can pull that up in the, oh, that's anyway. Lots of smeared paint in addition to the CT scanning further confirmed our um, suspicions just because of the amount of dowels that were filled over. And then these very um, modern looking drill marks that were very regular and all the same in all the feet um, is not something that you would see for an object in antiquity. Um, so when you're doing the visual compensation and you're like, um, sort of like when you're doing the visual compensation, uh, how do you draw the line between restoration and addition? Like, how do you make sure you aren't sort of adding your own touch to the artwork? How do you like make sure you're sort of like, you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. <laughs> and we grapple with that a lot. Um, I, I would. I approached this object with a very conservative approach. I wanted to add as little as possible, um, but the the excess plaster, the way it had, the way elements had been reattached, was quite distracting in understanding what was going on. And so we did feel that it was appropriate in this case to sort of hide some of that. It would be hard to remove it um, since it was applied wet to such a thirsty ancient surface, um, you can't really undo those types of things. So it was best to cover them up just to give a better understanding of the object. But yeah, we, we grapple with that a lot. We try to not do too much. I try to make it look like I haven't touched it. <laughs> you wanna see if you can open the question in the- Yeah, we also have a question in the chat, which is from Paul. Why is it called a solar boat? Are there lunar boats? Good question. It's um, referred to as a solar boat from fairly early on. And I think it's in comparison to later depictions of the day and the night bark that uh, Ra, the sun god is on. Um, they also uh, have quite a lot of yellow on them, which also makes them quite solar, which tends to be why they're called a solar boat. Uh, I don't know of any lunar boat models. So, um, good question. That was the only question in the chat. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And thanks to those of you for coming in person and to those of you who are on Zoom. We will have a recording of this program that will be on the website, hopefully by the end of the week. Thank you. Thank you.